Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all well. Uh, welcome to this BTEC Level 1, Level 2 Tech Award in Performing Arts Q&A online session. I hope you can all hear me. We'll do a little test in a moment to make sure you can. I am Paul Webster and I am the subject advisor for all of Pearson's Performing Arts and Drama qualifications. Um, my role is to provide support and guidance to teachers in terms of the delivery and assessment of our qualifications. Today's session will last an hour and I'm going to be focusing on the questions that were submitted to me via the expression of interest form that I sent out um, earlier this term. Uh, hopefully there will also be an opportunity for you to ask any new questions that come to hand in the final part of the session. So what we're going to do today is I'll give you a quick tour of our website, uh, looking at the Tech Award page and all the support materials to make sure you know where everything important can be found uh, on the rest of the, of the website as well, such as where the exam timetables are and the, form, uh, the forms and guidance documents. We'll then have a look at the questions you've submitted to me and then open up the floor to any questions. Um, so, the first thing we're going to do is have a look at the Tech Award um, page. To get to this, you go to Qualifications, you select All Qualifications, then you go to Tech Award and um, you go to Performing Arts. So, we have um, various tabs on the page where materials are kept. So, for example, on the first page on specification, you have the specification and the guide. You also have some very useful tips here as well. So to get to the quality assurance page, you can select this um, button here. In the second tab, we have the course materials. First thing are, is the specification and the sample assessment materials. If anybody has a question around um, where the mark scheme is, for the uh, component three of the Tech Award, you can find it in the sample assessment material. This is standard. We do this with every qualification before the first awarding so that the mark scheme that is going to be used <clears throat> is the, in, the, in, the indicative mark scheme is in uh, this document. Um, so that's in case anybody's lost as they um, wander around the website looking for things. The admin support guide for component three provides you with everything you need in terms of dates and details and how work should be recorded for component three. Uh, we have um, some guidance for the tech award um, on component three. We have the task itself uh, and we have the a template that you can use for component three and we have these lovely examples of sample mark learner work which we will talk about um, a little later on. For internally assessed units we have the authorised assignment briefs, um, we also have OSCAR materials for component one plus we have some sample mark learner work for component one in all three uh, disciplines of acting, dance and musical theatre at distinction and pass levels. Um, so there's um, some good things there and we also have uh, now some component two examples. This is just focusing on um, the log books that are created. We don't have any examples yet of practical work, but that's something that we are gathering at the moment. So we'll be able to share those with you um, later on in the year. What we then have uh, in the final tab is teaching and learning materials. So we have a course planner, we have FAQs, we have past training content. So if you were unable to attend any of our training events that we have them here and we have some schemes of work that you can use and adapt. So that's the, um, well, we also have the published resources as well, if you're interested for the Tech Award. So this is for um, the Component 3 Revision Guide uh, for students. And then there are also packs available for um, teaching uh, in a, a particular discipline. We also have on the um, 
website some other useful information that you would need and the best way to find this stuff is by using the search box at the top of the screen so i am typing in exam timetables um, because this is a very frequently asked question that i get uh, you can find out here um, where all the information is on the tech award uh, and um, and when the when uh, materials going to be um, released etc um, we also have a, a very useful um, BTEC guidance page so if you scroll to the bottom of any page that you're on our, on our website and select BTEC under the about us section uh, you will come to this area dedicated to BTEC and if you select the third tab which is teach BTEC uh, you can find lots of really useful information there. So whether it's um, guidance documents for students, uh, whether it's about delivering the course that you're doing or whether it's about training, there's lots of stuff here for you. Uh, the BTEC step-by-step -step page is an incredibly useful resource. When you go into here, it, it guides you through um, setting up uh, a BTEC all the way through to certificating your students. I'm showing this to you because I've had a couple of questions that we're going to have a look at in a moment, which are about um, verification and about where forms can be found. So using this page, it's really useful. Uh, you can find things like uh, the BTEC Centre Guide to Lead Internal Verifiers. You have all your templates here. So under Create an Assessment Plan, this will take you to all the Word documents that we have that you can use and um, adapt. Um, let's get on with the questions now. Um, the first question came from Matthew and he wanted some clarification on verifications and internal verifications as it is the first time that he's leading the course so i would suggest matthew that um, the page that we were just looking at is going to be a really good starting point for you um, and uh, to have a read of the um, guidance documents we have so the, for example the BTEC Centre Guide to Internal Assessment, uh, the, um, the Guide to Internal Verification uh, and the Guide to uh, Standards Verification because this will um, explain to you everything uh, that you need. So uh, Matthew if you have a look through that page hopefully that will give you um, a better idea of um, what you need to do uh, but please feel free to ask any questions during this event or you can email me or call me um, afterwards. The next question is from Terry and Terry asks what changes have been made since we began the spec for each component. Uh, there have been two significant changes made to the specification since we started. The first one is the inclusion of production design. And it's now possible for students to focus on design in components two and three. Design was always a feature of component one anyway, and all students are expected to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of how design elements within um, the work being studied uh, are, are, are created and work to communicate meaning with an audience. The second thing that has changed um, is the timing for component three. And uh, in the SAMs, we had been suggesting that it would be 10 to 15 minutes. But for those who've taken component three um, this um, year, you'll see that the actual um, time is seven to 15 minutes. So hopefully that gives a, um, a, 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 a better uh, set of, uh, a sense of opportunity for your students with um, the work that they're doing. Danny's question is, will there be any amendments with the award after the first year, i.e. to component one? And what I would say is that any changes we will make to component one would be to clarify the areas of coverage um, that we stated in the content. So, for example, there's been a bit of confusion over the term practitioners, as it's stated within the, the uh, component one content. In component one, a practitioner refers to any creative theatre maker or 
or screen maker, we'll, we'll call them, um, involved in the works being studied. So for example, a director, a designer, a performer, a choreographer, musical director, writer, these are all examples of practitioners. So there isn't necessarily the requirement for you to look at the big hitting practitioners, i.e. those with an international reputation, etc. You can do if you want to, but it's not a requirement for component one. So that really would be the only change around just clarifying those issues. Chris has asked uh, also, is component one likely to change? Wouldn't it benefit students who are entering the performing arts to explore practitioners rather than uh, productions? It's difficult to find materials on productions. Also, a practitioner approach would benefit them later on for component three. I have found component one uh, really tedious. So as I've said, the, you can focus on practitioners with a capital P, i.e. the one using the definition that we provide in the Nationals Unit 1, i.e. A, a practitioner is an individual or company with international recognition and an established reputation and presence. There is nothing to stop you from doing this, and there's, but there's no requirement to do so. And it might be that you've selected a work or works where the creatives involved don't have an international re recognition and haven't yet been an influencing force on other work, on other artists, but it's still really good and, and you would like to use it. You have information about it, you have support materials about it, you love the work, you can take the students to see it, you have recordings of it, etc. The purpose of component one is to introduce students to professional performance material, how it's made, who it's made for, and how it's received. And that's why we suggest that students should focus on productions, because we want to ensure that they get to understand what has contributed to the work and what the, those contributors wanted the audience to experience. And <clears throat> you can look at component one as a highly practical exploration uh, component that requires the students to demonstrate their skills and understanding of what they've learned in lots of different ways. Um, it's likely that they are to do, that they're going to do something where they are talking or they're writing about what they've done, but it doesn't have to be a tedious uh, experience for you or for the students. Um, and there are many ways in which you can use practical explanation, uh, exploration to, to bring this to life. So um, about in terms of finding materials um, for your students, there, there are um, company websites, there are that have um, information about productions that have been on, that include um, teaching and education packs, that include recordings of interviews and workshops with, um, with the practitioners involved. Um, and so just to give you uh, a couple of um, examples of that, I just wanted to show you, um, I just wanted to show you some examples. So this is the first one, and this is from, uh, it's the, the BBC produced it for A Curious Incident, and there are, um, 12 examples here and if I just show you this one um, just a very brief clip from this So there's just a little clip there from uh, Curious Incident, and this can be um, 
this can be uh, used in so many different ways. I'm sorry that you weren't able to, if you weren't able to hear the sound on that, I was just really trying to point out that there are, um, there are lots of different um, examples. I'll show you another one now, um, and I will, of course, uh, be able to share the um, links with you. Um, this is from the um, Donma Warehouse, and they have three um, they have three examples of the Shakespeare trilogy that they did. Um, again, with um, with interviews with those who have created the work, um, plus they've got teaching packs and they have this just the, the three recordings which are free for any for any schools that sign up to it um, of some wonderful contemporary interpretations of Shakespeare plays. So if you have seen these, you'll know how good they are. If you haven't, they're really worth having a look at because they really make the work relevant within the new context that um, that it's being shown. Um, we've also got things like uh, the um, Matthew Bourne page, New Adventures, and the work that they do in terms of their resources. And as you can see here, uh, they have a pack for every production that they've seen. Uh, they've got images, they've got lots of really useful information for you. Um, and on the presentation there, it's just some of the ideas that I've got. And when I send you the pack, you will be able to click onto these and they will take you to the pages. Um, we've also got uh, this from Improbable Theatre. You may not know Improbable, uh, but they do some fantastic work. Um, and they do a, they kind of a, it's an integration of uh, physical theater and some um, wonderful uh, ways of approaching design uh, and performance. So um, as you can see in these examples, it's the director and the choreographer working together um, with the performers to create a, a, a theatrical piece. Um, so that's improbable. And then the final one that I'm going to show you is very quickly for um, Wicked. And it might not be your cup of tea, but there are some great, um, there are some great things on here. Um, so for example, they've got um, w the work in progress, the sketches from particular costumes, uh, information on uh, application of makeup and costumes, etc. So um, there are there is lo there are lots of things out there. Obviously, we don't want you to be in a position where you can't find anything. So um, I we have a sharing best practice page, which I will um, show you um, on uh, Facebook in a short while. Uh, but there's all and and on on that. I've been put in this kind of information about, about um, possible websites that you can use and links that you can find. So I hope um, that is in some way useful to you, Chris. Let's move on to Danny now. And it's Danny's second question. And it is uh, about students who suffer with speech issues, how this would affect uh, internal and external marks and can there be any compensation? So the support that's available for students with existing and temporary conditions uh, is in terms of access arrangements um, and that's for existing and temporary conditions. So that's to help students with maybe it's about extra time that they need or having a reader or, or some kind of support. And then for temporary conditions, um, there are uh, special considerations. So special consideration requests can be made. Um, all the information on uh, spec cons is on your website, your, uh, on, on our website, and your exams officers uh, should be able to help you with this as well. But if you are unsure, then please let us know. Um, in the qualification itself, there isn't any compensation that 
so any adjustments that would be made to the mark schemes of either the internal or external units but there are uh, options available for students and actually uh, the to provide students with um, any opportunity to excel in in all of the components so for example a student with um, limited vocal expression, for example, could develop uh, performance or design skills in components two and three and access all the criteria available in those um, components through the selection of particular performance material and the focus that they have. So a student doesn't necessarily have to use their voice in their qualification. They could focus on dance, they could focus on physical theatre or on design. But if they do want to, if they do want to act and if they do want to perform, that's absolutely fine. Again, it's then about the um, the choice of the role and, and the character and, and how the voice is going to be used to express particular things. Um, so I would say that that is a way in which you might want to think about this course, that um, not every student is suitable for every type of role. And so um, you should think of it that way in terms of, well, if I were to cast you in this, would that be suitable? And if not, I will give you that role instead. It's not about limiting the choices. It's just about trying to find choices that are suitable for your particular students and their needs. The next question is from Gary. And Gary has asked um, why the, what is the reason for the paperwork and schedule to be so governed and heavy unlike rival technical awards find some of it unnecessary could it not be streamlined in terms of BTEC qualifications that all subject to quality assurance and that that quality assurance requires centers to administer um, internal verification of assessment processes and adhere to external standards verification of at least one of the um, internally assessed components. Sometimes there might be confusion within a centre regarding the amount of administrative paperwork that must be undertaken and it may be that there's an overcompensation. Uh, for example, um, if every rehearsal needs to be recorded or every lesson needs to be evaluated by the students and the teacher and that th those aren't necessary to, to for, for a student to be able to uh, complete a, com a particular component so it's really important that teachers IV um, IVers and anybody else involved in the quality assurance within a centre reads those guidance documents that I showed you earlier about internal verification and standards verification to ensure they understand what they have to do and they're not doing too much we have my BTEC which um, is a system which is an administrative system that, that, that we um, oversee and that may be one way in which you could alleviate some of the paperwork. In regards to rival technical awards, uh, just to clarify, Ofqual defined technical awards as level one and two qualifications that provide 14 to 16 year olds with applied knowledge and practical skills. They're first launched in 2016 and they provide an alternative option to general qualifications at this level, i.e. GCSE. In order for the technical awards to be included uh, in Progress 8 and Key Stage 4, um, they have to adhere to certain off-call requirements, like there needs to be 40% um, externality, there needs to be a certain percentage of theoretical written work. So, you know, ideally we just have a qualification which was all practical, but we're not allowed to do that um, if we want the qualification to count in the measures. Um, I'm not sure, Gary, if you're referring to rival technical awards, i.e. the ones run by other awarding bodies, um, such as AQA or RSL. Uh, I can't see you in this meeting, but I will continue for anybody else who is interested in this, that if there is any confusion around the term tech, uh, the, you know, the tech award, there are also technical certificates 
their level two qualifications, but they're aimed at post 16 students and they are kind of uh, much more direct in terms of providing skills and knowledge for, for employment um, or further technical study. There's also tech levels, which are level three qualifications, and they're also for post-16 students. So the tech awards are very different to those, so it may be that there's some confusion around um, the terminology that's used by Ofqual. Samantha. Uh, vale has asked a few questions. Here's the first one, and it's when should the, an assignment brief be given out? Um, an assignment brief for components one and two should be given to students when they are sufficiently prepared to meet the demands of the assessment tasks. And this means that students should be given time to explore, experiment, and fail before the assessment begins. So as an example, you know, if you have 36 hours that have been given to you to deliver component one, you could split that time in half, assign 18 hours to the pre-assessment work, i.e. the exploration, the experiment, trying things out, getting things wrong, and then the second uh, 18 hours to the actual assessment tasks. Uh, Samantha's second question is, do students need to provide evidence in their assessments of a certain number of roles, e.g. director, designer for component one? In component one, if we're using the term practitioners to mean all creative contributors to professional work, uh, we should go, we should be uh, working on the assumption that most, if not all, of the examples that students look at will include the following. A director and or a musical director and or a choreographer, at least one performer. It could be a writer and or a composer if it's if it's an acting or um, or a musical theatre piece. Live musicians, if that's part of the work, if the, if the live musicians are integral to the work itself. And then designers in terms of set, costume, lighting, hair and makeup, sound, props, etc. And all students in component one, regardless of the chosen disciplines that they're looking at in components two and three, should be looking at the relationships between the different participants in component one. Emma has asked um, about for clarification about the length of performances for component one. How long do the professional performances have to be and how long do all of the workshops need to be? In component one, there isn't a preferred length for um, for the component one works that you look at. The, you know, the purpose of the component is that you're introducing students to a range of work across one or more disciplines. And this might mean, for example, if we're looking at acting, um, you could look at a full length play like punk rock, by Simon Stevens, which lasts about two hours. You could look at a contemporary play, such as Swallow by Steph Smith, and that's about 55 minutes. And then you could look at an autobiographical solo work by Bryony Kimmings, for example, that lasts about an hour and a half. Um, if you're doing a workshop with students, you could spend anywhere between, you know, 15 minutes and three hours on a practical workshop. Not all of that needs to be recorded. Uh, it might be that there is a group discussion or vivas at the end where the students get the chance then to talk about what they've learned and you just record that. It might be that you record 10 minutes of small groups working together where you're just moving around with the camera, seeing how they're interacting. It might be that you do a five minute rehearsed improvisation uh, in the middle of the session where they demonstrate their understanding of a particular process or way of working. It might be a skills audit where they are doing solo work they, and they each perform a short rehearsed scene or section of work at the start of this process um, so that you can then see how they're getting on. Um, so there is uh, no fixed lengths is the uh, basic answer to that, Emma. Marissa has asked about component two and what is the theoretical content behind component two, if any? Component two focuses on the development of practical skills and techniques. 
and any theoretical work is focusing on the student capturing uh, evidence of their development. So we have some examples, uh, as, we, as we saw before on our website, of some logbooks. And they are, um, provide really clear examples of what students will be expected to do. And apart from that, they could be keeping a, a, a working notebook as you are going through. Like, say, for example, you were teaching your students about Laban and Laban movement and you wanted them to write down um, the terminology and potentially some of the symbols that's used in Laban notation, then that's great, but it's not a requirement necessarily. So um, I would suggest that uh, by theoretical, if you mean written work, if you mean the non-practical stuff, it's for learning AMC and um, it's the uh, logs of the evaluation of the of the skills development. The next question is from Philippa, who asks about the use of teacher observation sheets and whether they're still seen as supportive and valid evidence. And my answer is that it really depends on how they're being used. If um, you have a recording of students working or if the, if the students are, are performing, there's not necessarily any requirement then for you to do this additional paperwork. If it's about you making notes for you then to give feedback to them um, on the on the um, feedback form, then that's fine. But a teacher observation record is something that can stand alone and can be given back to the students to give them, you know, uh, feedback on what they've done. So that's not necessary as such. Um, if an observation sheet is used when a recording is impossible to do, so impossible as in you've got 30 in the room, it's a nightmare, the noise is ridiculous, but by standing next to them and just being able to scribble things down, then it's fine. Then potentially, um, then it's going to be a, 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 a valid way to capture evidence. But you don't have to do them for every activity. If you've already got examples, and as you know, for when you're submitting work for components one and two, uh, and, the, and you're looking at milestones, um, that means that you're not looking at every single one everywhere. You, uh, you don't have to get evidence for every single session that you're working with the students. The next question is from Gwen, and Gwen has asked a, about component three and the 600 words for the three written activities. Uh, is this a guide or a limit? For component three, um, we have set tasks with guidance that states that students should write up to 600 words per activity. Um, there are some teachers who feel that those students can't express themselves sufficiently in order to meet the range of criteria available within 600 words and have asked us what will happen if students exceed this limit. Our advice is that students shouldn't go over um, 600 words per activity. Um, if a student does go over 600 words, are they going to be penalised? Well, not necessarily, no. So if they've gone over, you should still send the work to us and you shouldn't make the students redo it. Because when you look at the task and the whole idea of this task being an external assessment is that your role is as uh, you're an invigilator and uh, you know, you're facilitating the work as it's, as it's being created by the students, but you're not meant to have any um, involvement as such. So don't ask the students to redo their work. If they've gone over, they've gone over and you can please um, send it to us. Eleanor has just asked, so are we saying they should do 600? I'll say this again. <clears throat> don't have, when you're guiding your students, say to them they should write up to 600 words. If when they've completed it, they've written 700 or they've written 800, there's nothing you can do about it and you can still submit it, and it's still something that we will assess. We will ensure that all our examiners know how to apply the mark scheme before they begin to do the assessment, and that they'll, they'll, they'll mark consistently to the lead examiner's standard, 
and they will be instructed on issues around well what happens if a student's only done 400 words what happens if a student has submitted 800 words we will all the work will be assessed but what will happen is that the any that don't um that go exceed by however many words whatever it would be is that the senior examining team will then have a look at those to to make a decision about the marks that can be awarded <clears throat> so i hope um, that's clear that you know wherever possible guide your students to meet the requirements of the task um, students will they will be marked on the work that they submit regardless of how many words they submit I hope that is now clear. Um, let's move on to Sarah's question, which is, can we have clearer guidance on what designers need to submit? Um, the mark scheme in the SAMS makes no reference to designers for activity three. So um, the the following information is in the task itself. So the students are, you know, they, they, they select one of the um, eight options available from costume, makeup, masks, hair, set, props, lighting, sound. And then they will pitch present their ideas to the invited audience. Um, and the pitch presentation will be between uh, five to 10 minutes, must be recorded. Uh, the students don't have to have their design elements realized in the performance um, but the the design ideas must be in the pitch presentation all design students should be able to demonstrate the process of their design ideas from initial responses the research that they've done the ideas that they've had how those ideas were developed and then the final design that they've come up with the presentation can be where they just speak directly to camera they can use sketch books they can use notebooks they can show swatches like material samples they can have a1 sheets of brainstorming ideas they can have a model box they can have a maquette they can have whatever they want there is an expectation that those teachers who are offering design in their center for those students who want to design will have some experience of of what a designer what a design process looks like and what a designer will go through um, but of course it may be that you're a little bit rusty and you need some ideas so if so um, please contact me and um, I can give you some guidance um, it may be that um, so for example for costume uh that the, the students are going to show the, the designs for one or more of the characters they could put together a little costume plot and a list of the costumes that each performer would wear and what and um and any changes for makeup similar makeup design for one or more of them same for masks same for her um for a set it could be that they've got the drawings of the performance space they've got a ground plan showing where the exits and entrances are audience positioning where the stage furniture is a model box which is what really they should be doing they should be working towards um, for props it could be that again they've got um they've got their sketches and ideas they've got um they've got maybe a mock-up of what the prop would look like depending on how sophisticated it is it might be a maquette it could be um and you know it could be the actual prop itself that they've that or props that they've created for the lighting design uh which is being asked by felicity um the lighting i would say is um if, if a student is going to if the student is going to focus on lighting design that they should be considering well I'm going to have different lighting states now it that might be uh, that there's a series of spotlights because it's, it's the work that they're doing so there's you know four spotlights in a row which could be used and it's when they would be used but also the student should be showing some development of ideas because remember 
this is the design this is the, des the design ideas they don't have to be realized so the design student can be thinking about well ideally what would i have when this work is put together how, you know how creative can i be with this to to show the work in the best light to highlight these particular themes the same with sound um, students should be looking for uh, different sounds, whether they are underscoring, whether it's about sound effects, whether it's about incidental music, you know, there's the, it's what it is, uh, what the what it's being used for, what its purpose is, where they've sourced it from. Um, that it's really about that the design students should be showing as they've gone through a process of development in the same way that the performers have. All design students, regardless of which um, area they look at, should take into consideration the relationship between the performer and the audience, health and safety, and how it would work in terms of usage, for example, that that's not relevant in every case, but in, in the majority of it's how um, it, it would be done. Um, in regards to activity three, activity three in the mark scheme, is going to assess either the performance or the presentation. The mark scheme in the SAMs, the top band still refers to performers, but it won't be the case in the actual mark scheme. So when you have a look in the mark scheme, that third section, activity three, can be applied to the designers because it's about the designer in role, how they are intending to communicate their ideas um, to an audience. Uh, Danny. Uh, has asked, in regards to the recording of the final performance for component three, do the audience need to be visible? It can be front of the audience. Uh, no, they don't need to be visible, no. That's that's absolutely fine. Uh, the next question is from um, Sarah, or Sarah, sorry if I pronounced it wrong, and it was, uh, your, your question is, would it, it would be useful for further clarification of the grading criteria throughout all three components and reliable timings of when more sample work will be released. Um, if you are, you are on here, um, Sarah, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind just clarifying what you mean by the further clarification, because that's quite a um, wide ranging question there. Um, in regards to sample mark learner work, for component one, we have three sets of mark work so far. We have two on the website, uh, which we had a look at before, and then we've got one on Oscar as well. For component two, we've got the uh, the learning aim C log entries at distinction and pass levels. For component three, we've got two examples of um, uh, student performances and um, and possible uh, activities, written activities that they have created. We will aim to provide more examples of work when we can. So for example, once we've done the first awarding of component three uh, in the summer, we should be then, be then be able to release some more examples of um, the work because the work that we have at the moment was done very kindly by some centers we work with and it, we it, it's an approximation so if you've seen it it's like well the performance doesn't last as uh, to the minimum performance time and it's like we know this is this is where we're at in terms of what we could get so we thought it would be better to release some examples and some indications than nothing at all uh, amy has asked um a very similar question. So hopefully, Amy, um, that's answered your question as well. Uh, but feel free to to ask another if you wish in the chat box. Um, Samantha's third question is about what a workshop performance is and can the students wear costume and have props and set. A workshop performance is in some way unfinished. It's work in progress. Uh, there is an industry term for sharing work with an audience known as a scratch performance and um, that's done in order for those for the for the creative people involved to understand if the performance material in its current state is good enough should it be should it be developed more does it need further changes so it's like a, like a work in progress idea um, so a, a workshop performance um, might focus on some particular element 
uh, e.g. it might be the relationship between the performers in a highly physical work but doesn't yet have full costume and set because it's more important for the performers to understand if the if the material works before they would then invest in production elements so in answer to your question Samantha if you wanted to go the whole hog and have them in cost if they wanted to wear costumes they want to have everything then that is absolutely fine it's just there's not a requirement to do that especially within the time that they have but if they want to and if for example you have students who are doing design uh, and there is the opportunity to do this then it's it's absolutely fine um natasha her first question is none of the sample model and work for component three gives an example of what you expect to reach at the top band Will there be more sample mark work release uh, showcasing how students should achieve the top band level? Yes, Natasha. So hopefully what I just said earlier answers that, uh, which is um, that we will release stuff if we have it. Um, obviously, after the first awarding, we'll also have the benefit of the uh, lead examiner report for this. And they'll also be able to provide some more examples of um, the type of work that students should be uh, doing and ha and did do to achieve the top bands. Natasha's second question is about the grey boundaries for component three uh, for past merit and distinction. And unfortunately, we don't have grade, we don't set grey boundaries until the um, it's been awarded, until the task has been awarded, i.e. all the students have been given a mark for their work across the national cohort and then samples are taken from the from all the the whole student group to ensure parity and to ensure the standard and levels of work in this particular exam sitting and then we determine where the grade boundaries are and i'm sorry that we can't have um we can't provide you with more um information at this point uh Obviously, once the first assessment takes place this summer, we'll have a much clearer idea of um, of how this is going to run um, as a, a, an activity. Okay, so that uh, hopefully is all the questions that were sent in to me. There's about 25 of them there. Um, now we open the floor to um, any questions that you have and I'm just going to go back through um, and have a look at what you've been asking me um, so uh, Jason has said um, about from uh, about the observation records being valid uh, if accompanied by corresponding learner generated evidence um, so an observation record is not valid unless there is a video of the noisy session uh, or if the learner refers, refers to the specific session in their log. Um, I would say that everything within reason and that if you if you if you are going to be doing if you are going to use observation records, which you don't really have to as such after what we were talking about before but if you're going to that the yeah there will need to be some kind of record of when it took place um and so uh, i would say it just really depends on the reason but in most cases you don't really need to use them um the next question is from danny for component one final uh for component one final performance does the presentation for students doing a design role need to be recorded in front of an audience if it does does it need to be at the beginning or end of the group performance and does it need to be continuous recording or can you stop filming after the presentation oh i think do you is i, th I think is this for component three danny i think rather than it being for component one let's go with component three um if it should be if possible that you would do it before uh, the actual performance takes place and that you set the camera up you would rec say you had four design students that you record each one individually and then you record the performance itself individually there is no requirement for you to just keep filming as such so I hope that's clear if it is about component one can you uh, clarify please um, Eleanor said about 
I just about feeling bad about students done 600 for log one but hearing others have gone over has worried me Eleanor I really I don't worry because we're not in any way suggesting that if a student hands in 700 words that that's better than the student who hands in 600 words. The student who hands in up to 600 words has done what the task required. Any student who goes over, we will deal with on a case by case basis and we'll look at the work. So please don't feel bad. Um, Felicity, you were asking about the, uh, about the lighting for component three. So hopefully I, answered that when we were talking about the requirements but if you do need any more help then let me know I would say um, that they that you know you talked about compa the comparison with the GCSE and, and I think if you have done uh, supported students with design in GCSE then maybe you should consider it in a, in a similar way that it is an equivalent qualification so um, but again the students don't have to have the final design realized in this. Um, will there be examples of lower grades, um, asks Amy, e.g. level one merit? Um, I hope so, and that is a request that I'm going to put in, um, Amy, because the majority of requests that we get are for, oh, we need to see, we need to see top band, we need to see distinction, but, um, uh, thank you for that. I will um, I will put that forward to our assessment team to see what we can can get because uh, that's going to be really useful. Um, Felicity, no, they won't get marked down if they've done 600 words. Um, so, um, oh, Sarah, you have clarified about the guidance on what would be con uh, considered discussing, explaining, uh, describing. And um, if you've had a look at the sample mark learner work, um, one would hope that that would give you some uh, indications about the difference between the student who is describing and the student who is explaining uh, in terms of the level of detail that they go to and uh, the, the whole thing about one is, is is just stating what has happened whereas i.e the the, des the describer whereas the explainer is, is able is able to go into some depth of uh making connections of being able to talk about why something exists or why something has happened not just to talk about the fact that it happened um if you are, if you have had a look at the um, sample work and it's still unclear, then could you email into me, please, for some more guidance? Um, that would be great. Um, Emma, for some, as asked, for someone who is brand new to BTEC, has absolutely no experience, where is the best place to start for support? Um, Emma, at the top of the event, we had a look at the uh, BTEC um, delivery page in order to understand um, the process of what you need to go through um, but I think that and so maybe you can have a look at that and that's going to give you guidance on uh, internal verification on how to write assignments um, on how to assess your students um, but it may be that you need uh, a bit more guidance that's subject specific. Um, we have some um, things on the um, Tech Award page, and um, which I'm, I'm just getting up for you now. So for example, um, in the training materials tab, we have a getting ready to teach a recorded event that you can have a look at there that, that may be useful to you as well um, and if you have a look at that and then contact me there I am there are my details um, and uh, either myself or one of my colleagues Billy or Rima will be able to should be able to answer the questions that you have um, 
So just going through, Danny has asked about students being able to complete all three logs on the same day. You can do that. That's absolutely fine. You can it, it's, you manage that process so they can be done over a number of weeks or all in one day. Um, it's just that when they are doing um, it, because of the stages that they're going through, um, it may be more difficult for them to be able to, to you know, to, to the development of the work. So it really just depends on where they're at and how they've been able to collate their notes. Um, I can see that Eleanor has um, given some examples there of the criteria for um, component one learning aim B. And I think that I, in order for me to be able to answer that, we need to take this offline. So I think that we could do this via email, if that's all right. And Eleanor, um, if you were able to send me that as a question, uh, please, that would be really useful. And then I can send out the answer to everyone as an email. I think that's probably the best way to do it, if that's OK. Um, so here are my details again, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for my face. Uh, that's the number that you can call. Uh, that's the email address. Uh, I'm on Twitter, so you can tweet me. We have a uh, sharing best practice um, page on um, Facebook, which looks like this. And uh, we have got lots of materials in here. We've got um, questions that teachers send in. Um, I've been putting the links on to um, to some of the uh, examples of websites that I showed you earlier. So if you're not on there, join us um, and, um, and we can share some ideas. And I'm just thinking, actually, I could put the answer to your question, Eleanor, on um, the um, sharing best practice page. That would be useful, wouldn't it? Um, so if you wouldn't mind still emailing it into me and I'll stick it on there, that would be great. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope this has been useful for you. Um, and um, good luck with everything. Uh, enjoy the work that you do. And I will, I'm sure that I will be speaking to you in the future. Uh, and the best of luck and take care. Thank you very much and goodbye.